Tonight, a historic day in the state of New York. The best way I can help now is if I step aside and let government get back to governing. One week after the bombshell report released by Attorney General Tish James and a criminal complaint filed by an accuser, Andrew Cuomo, New York's 56th governor, announces he's stepping down from office. Now, what's next for the governor's political career? I know I'm the voice of women who have been voices. I can speak about their issues. I know what it's like to be a mom. And what lies ahead for Kathy Hochul, who steps into the spotlight while also making history as the state's first female governor. And thanks so much for joining us tonight. I'm Tamson Fidel. I'm Corey Chambers. After months of sexual harassment allegations, Governor Cuomo is now stepping down. Yeah, the move comes as impeachment proceedings have officially started in Albany by the state's Democratic uh, lead legislature. Yeah, we have team coverage tonight. Pick 7's Jay Dow taking a look at the possible impacts of Governor Cuomo's resignation and the impact it could have on the handling of the pandemic in New York State from this point forward. Allison Caden has a reaction from New Yorkers, but we begin with Pick 7's Marvin Scott tonight from the governor's office in Midtown with the details on what led up to today's stunning announcement. Marvin. Stunning indeed, a stunning fall from Grace Thompson. You know, the governor recognized he came to grips with the reality that he no longer could withstand or withhold the barrage of sexual harassment charges being leveled against him. And he also faced the specter of being forced out of office by impeachment. He recognized he had only one choice to make. My resignation will be effective in 14 days. Governor Cuomo, who initially vowed to fight to the bitter end, succumbed to pressure just one week after Attorney General Letitia James issued a 165-page report detailing allegations of sexual harassment involving 11 women. Even as he was agreeing to step aside, Cuomo remained under defensive. I never touched anyone inappropriately. This is not to say that there are not 11 women who I truly offended. There are. And for that, I deeply, deeply apologize. What he did to me was a crime. He broke the law. Brittany Comiso is the only accuser to file a criminal complaint against the governor for allegedly groping her. The complaints against the governor are considered misdemeanors, and defense attorney Arthur Idella doesn't see the likelihood of any criminal trial. There's a presumption amongst the legal community that Governor Cuomo already cut a deal with prosecutors not to be prosecuted in lieu of his resignation. The governor's decision to resign comes after just about all of his political allies abandoned him, and the Judiciary Committee of the State Assembly, with overwhelming support, was moving toward impeachment proceedings, which Cuomo said would cost cost the state millions of dollars, the governor decided to step aside for, as he said, the good of the state. It is a matter of life and death government operations. And wasting energy on distractions is the last thing that state government should be doing. In 14 days, Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul will take over as the state's first women's governor. In a statement, she said, I agree with Governor Cuomo's decision to step down. It is the right thing to do and in the best interest of New Yorkers. I am prepared to lead as New York State's 57th governor. I think it's fitting that we have our Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul stepping in, particularly given the circumstances under which the governor resigned. Now we'll hear, we'll hear from Kathy Hochul tomorrow. She is scheduled a two o'clock news conference. Uh, meantime, uh, Governor Cuomo, he still could face impeachment. Uh, that would bar him forever seeking uh, political office again. Now that decision will be made by the Assembly Judiciary Committee when it meets again next Monday. All in all, a very sad day in New York politics. Reporting live from the governor's Midtown office, Marvin Scott, Pix 11 News, Tamsin, Corey. And we'll be on the air at 2 o'clock when we hear from who will be the state's next governor. So thank you for that, Marvin. All right, well, reaction to the governor's decision to resign came in swiftly. Elected officials from all across the state weighing in on this one. Yeah, New Yorkers are also responding to this big announcement. Pix 7's Allison Caden joins us live from Union Square with details tonight. Allison. In just about two weeks, Cuomo will be out of office and people are celebrating down here in Union Square. And while many are saying it's a step forward, I did find some Cuomo supporters on the streets of New York. 
there's consequences for everyone's actions. A week after the state attorney general's office released a report that Governor Andrew Cuomo sexually harassed at least 11 women, he announced he will step down in two weeks. You should never touch someone unwarningly. So if there's all these accusations and there's proof and there's an investigation, you should resign. Sonia Osorio, the president of the National Organization for Women, New York City. It may take a long time for him to really come to terms with his behavior. Behavior the governor still maintains was not criminal. This is not to say that there are not 11 women who I truly offended. There are. And for that, I deeply, deeply apologize. Attorney Gloria Allred represents the state trooper mentioned in the attorney general's report. The trooper told investigators Cuomo ran his hand across her back and stomach. She has no plans to do interviews with the press but feels that the governor did the right thing. The governor still has some supporters on the streets of New York City. I don't think it meant to be a sexual harassment or anything. I think he did a good job last year and every other year, and uh, it's, it's, it's bad, but it is politics. Cuomo's handling of the COVID-19 crisis was praised in the beginning, but the directive to admit COVID patients to nursing homes with allegations of a cover-up, lying about the number of deaths, tarnished his straight shooting image. Cuomo says he no longer wants to be a distraction. Kathy Hochul will be New York State's first female governor. And she is a very formidable, competent woman who is prepared to take the mantle. And she is a champion for women. A bye-bye Cuomo rally was advertised on social media today. Now, thunderstorms did delay that, but now you have a few dozen young people behind me, about 100 feet or so back happily screaming expletives about the governor. We are live in Union Square. Allison Caden, PIX11 News. This is a weather alert from PIX11 News. All right, our other big story tonight, that heat wave across the tri-states. Yeah, right now several parts of New York City are under an excessive heat warning, and some could actually have temperatures feeling like triple digits. G is tracking all of it for us. All right, big fella, you got it right. The triple digits starting on uh, figure Wednesday late, certainly on Thursday. You got an excessive heat warning in effect from Rockland all the way down across New Jersey, across the five boroughs through Thursday. That means duration, that means a problem. The humidity sky high at 93%. You see radar shows a couple of scattered showers, Nassau and Suffolk County. Cruz goes on the control, and you can see again as we look at this from Hempstead, North Hempstead, Hicksville into Huntington in uh, Again, uh, that area, Nassau, Suffolk County, you'll be the last to give it up in terms of rainfall. That will end probably within the next half hour. The real problem is this searing heat that will take charge starting tomorrow. The heat index right around 101 from 2 to about 5 o'clock and then tapers off to 90 degrees. Uh, that's a heat index at night. Again, haze, heat, and humidity. But here's a hopeful sign, all right? Cooler Canadian air is on the move. When does it arrive? We'll talk about that just a little later on. The U.S. government has uh, not approved COVID booster shots, saying there's just no evidence follow-up vaccines are necessary. However, that has not stopped some people from acquiring them. According to the CDC, at least 1,000 people have received a third dose by falsifying information to health care providers. Pfizer is already planning to seek FDA approval for a third shot. Health experts say the booster could act like a fire extinguisher, providing an extra layer of protection in an emergency. If you have months and months later an exposure to COVID-19, um, just like if you had a fire in your house, you can now take out that tool and use it. The World Health Organization urging wealthier nations to avoid booster shots. The medical experts say making sure all countries have access to the first vaccinations is the best way to ensure a dangerous new variant does not emerge. Well, the rapid spread of the Delta variant has prompted the CDC to expand its travel advisory list. The government added seven new destinations to the highest COVID risk category. They're on the screen there. Aruba, France, Iceland, Israel, among the areas with more than 500 cases per 100,000 residents. CDC continues to advise against all international travel for non-vaccinated Americans. When we come back, how Governor Cuomo's resignation is impacting the state's COVID response. And the latest on a Queens penthouse explosion. We're going to tell you 
One investigator is found when they entered the apartment. Plus, newly released video shows details of a police-involved shooting that happened in Midtown in May. We're back with all of it in 90 seconds. You're watching the PIX11 News at 10 with Tamsin Fidel, Corey Chambers, Mr. G with your weather, and Andy Adler with sports. We are New York's very own. Governor Cuomo got national recognition for leading New York through the deadliest days of the coronavirus pandemic. Now some worry that his resignation and everything that has now come with it has become a giant distraction in Albany. More troubling is that it's happening as COVID cases are rising again due to the Delta variant out there. Jay Dow is live tonight in Washington Heights with more for us. Hi, Jay. Hi, Tamsin. So even after today's resignation announcement, local and county officials are still reeling about the silence, the lack of direction that they say they were getting from Albany at a time when they say they needed it the most. His daily briefing seemed ubiquitous, a calm dose of reassurance coming from a trusted three-term governor at the height of the coronavirus pandemic. New York State's local and county officials did not have to worry about formulating policy or a plan of attack. Governor Andrew Cuomo was there almost daily to reassure us this too would pass. And people have to take a tip, step back, a deep breath, and actually understand what we're looking at. What a contrast between then, during the early months of last year, and now. Specifically, the last few days leading up to Tuesday's surprise resignation announcement from the embattled governor. Cuomo will now hand over the reins for the state's pandemic strategy and messaging to Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul. I'm very worried about the Delta variant. And so should you be. Local and county officials across the Empire State have complained openly about the lack of leadership and direction from Albany in the midst of a crippling investigation into Cuomo's conduct, coupled with a rising spike in COVID cases and hospitalizations. The governor has taken almost no assertive actions to slow down Delta and we've paid a price for it. New York City Councilman Mark Levine, who chairs the health committee, says he's hoping new leadership will help iron out the inconsistencies we've seen play out across the state. The same is true for mask mandates. Uh, no guidance on school protocols, how to keep people safe. Uh, booster shots are going to be required very soon, and that's going to require state authorization. Mayor de Blasio does one thing, and I do something different, and Laura Kern on Nassau County does a third thing. You have a mishmash, and that creates both confusion. Just north of the Bronx border in Westchester County, County Executive George Latimer is hopeful the existing patchwork of local school masking policies will ultimately give way to a statewide unifying masking and vaccination standard, which will ease the path forward for families of students returning to school this fall. When you have any instability at the state, any questioning, what will the outgoing governor do? What will the incoming governor do? That kind of instability freezes people. And when you're freezing them, you're not making decisions that you need to make right now because school's three weeks away. It bears repeating Governor Cuomo's resignation isn't effective for another 14 days. And as of tonight, local and county officials are still calling their individual shots when it comes to masking mandates with the school year closing in fast. We're live in Washington Heights tonight. Jay Dow, PIX11 News. It'll be interesting to see if the position uh, changes in two weeks when we have a new governor. Uh, Jay, thank you so much for that. Well, coming up at 1030, Mary Murphy has a look at what we can learn from past history about where things go from here for state leadership, plus the legacy Andrew Cuomo created before this stunning fall from grace. All right, new developments tonight about a Queens apartment explosion that left one person dead. Yeah, it's now being investigated as a homicide. As police say, the man they found inside had multiple stab wounds. The explosion happened at around 1030 this morning at an apartment building on Elmhurst. In Elmhurst, excuse me, the fire spread quickly. Some who live in the area thought that maybe a plane hit the building after seeing those flames shooting out of the sixth floor and hearing the sound of it. I heard uh, an explosion. Uh... And then the, the, the building shook. Everything was shaking and, you know, crashing. And then I just, I immediately evacuated with my uncle and we saw smoke and fire. It took about 140 firefighters to get that fire under control. Four had minor injuries. Officials are also saying the fire may have been set to cover up the homicide. The Red Cross is now helping about 44 people who have been displaced as a result. Well, the NYPD has released body cam footage of a police-involved shooting. 
It happened on the West Side Highway back in May. A carjacking suspect rammed a police vehicle, prompting an NYPD sergeant to fire his weapon. No one was hit. The sergeant and another officer were wearing body cameras that were activated after the shots were fired. And the suspect behind the wheel was later identified as 44-year-old Johnny Diaz. He was arrested and charged with grand larceny and criminal mischief. His case, it's now being prosecuted by the New York County District Attorney's Office. And elected officials and activists protested outside the stock exchange, demanding corporations do more to fight gun violence. The group says Wall Street is in a position to make a historic difference and invest in New York City communities. Jamani Williams called on corporations to use their resources to fight the illegal gun trade linked to the recent rise in street violence. So we are here to talk to Wall Street, who are the genesis of that iron pipeline of guns flowing into the community. To tell them, at minimum, what you can do is give some of that blood money to communities who are trying to stop the blood from shedding. The group went on to say public-private partnerships can improve safety and create business opportunities for all New Yorkers. Well, police say they've just busted a, a drug ring that was running 24 hours a day out of one of the city's most famous spots. Authorities say eight men were selling crack cocaine out of Times Square, working in shifts so they could push the drug around the clock. Police say they conducted more than 650 sales in just the one 11 day period. So far, six men have been arrested and two are still out there. The men are being charged with conspiracy to distribute crack cocaine, which carries a mandatory minimum of 10 years in prison and a maximum sentence of life in prison. Well, former Suffolk County District Attorney Thomas Spoda and his top eight have been sentenced to five years in prison each for helping cover up the beating of a man in police custody. Yeah, a jury convicted the man of conspiracy, obstruction of justice, and witness tampering. It's all tied to former police chief James Burke and his assault of a man accused of stealing a duffel bag from his vehicle. Federal prosecutors say they damaged public safety by abusing their power. Spoda is scheduled to report to authorities in December. He was also ordered to pay $100,000 as part of this sentence. All right, let's get back to the weather story because right now this yeah. is like a bit of a reprieve. 72 degrees, not too bad, but what's coming is bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, actually, the humidity is very high also, Corey, and that makes it uncomfortable. Here's the amount of rain we had, 0.83 in the buck. It came down hard fast for about 45 minutes. There's LaGuardia, 0 0.40. Humidity again sky high subtly in at eight miles per hour we'll go to work now nassau county smithtown that area a couple of scattered showers about most of the action here will be south of the city but a couple of scattered showers not out of the question there's the line that went through another line approaching much lighter probably dissipating still could have scattered showers about and then the heat is on now the deal is going to be ongoing heat right through saturday a pop-up scattered shower or thunderstorm is still possible but remember that number 100 one that's the heat index tomorrow in the afternoon you can remember this number also because by thursday in the afternoon will be and feel like 103 and 100 in belmont 101 in newburgh and the beat goes on it's a heat problem it is dangerous for duration it will last through saturday and then the leading edge of the cold front with the jet piling in from canada will cool us down so haze heat and humidity and searing heat at that right through saturday got away for the front to cross ocean two to four feet the sound of foot a low to moderate rip current Big numbers, everybody, 91, 96, 95, heat indices over 100, and then Saturday it gets better. Let's talk about the better news later on. All right, G, thank you. All right, after the break tonight, why some riders want the MTA to keep the cash option as the agency moves away from paper money. Yeah, plus the show must go on. We're getting an inside look at the new documentary, About a Year Without Broadway. We'll be right back. Your cash will no longer be good at subways or buses if the MTA gets its way. And yeah, the Transit Authority is pushing to move to a cashless system, but the decision is being met with resistance. Pick 7's Michelle Ross explains why tonight. I put out this dollar bill, and you know what it said? This note is legal tender for all debt, public and private. Cash is not king at least for the MTA. The machine's not accepting cash, only credit cards. When the machines are down, the booth attendants are there as backup. But what will writers do? 
if the MTA implements its hopeful policy of eliminating both cash and booth attendance. The MTA's decision is partly motivated by trying to cut down on labor costs. Where do you go when somebody gets pushed on the tracks or some crime is being committed or a person needs to know where they gotta go? There's nobody there. Transit workers and advocates outside the Broadway Junction subway station say it's discriminatory against disabled and poor people. 11.2% of New York City households are unbanked, meaning they don't have a bank account. 22% of New York City residents don't have credit history. Jessica De La Rosa is disabled and has countless stories why a cashless system puts her at a disadvantage. I have the reduced fare card and um, the auto gate ate it. So then I, I had no way, nobody was at the booth, and there was a construction guy who didn't have the key to open the thing, so I had to wait six weeks to get my reduced fare card back. Workers say they should be heard because they got up every day as essential workers while the people at the top stayed home. They keep changing leadership all the time, but we're still here. Okay, we know how to do this job. Get the cash back in the booth. Advocates also say that they didn't fight for the federal government to award $14 billion to the MTA to make it harder for riders to take public transportation. At the Broadway Junction subway station, Michelle Ross, PIX11 News. So the MTA released a statement saying the MTA is evaluating options and communicating with our labor partners to determine the best outcome for our customers. We'll certainly keep an eye on that one for you. Mm -hmm. And a documentary about how the pandemic shut down the theater industry premiered last night right here in the city. Yeah, the film is called The Show Must Go On. It premiered last night at the Majestic Theater. The doc follows two different productions, the world tour, the Phantom of the Opera and the South Korean tour of cats. Yeah, both productions pressed on during the early stages of the pandemic and they opened shows in South Korea during the spring and summer of 2020. When we started planning this premiere in May, it felt as though the pandemic was in the rearview mirror, theater's resurgence was imminent, and the film felt like a portrait of a time gone by. Yet here we are today and uncertainty creeps in yet again. Last night's premiere benefiting the Actors Fund, which has distributed now more than $22 million to more than 16,000 people since March of 2020. Well, when we come back tonight, what happens now that Governor Cuomo is leaving office? We're breaking down the political fallout for you. Yeah, plus look back at the governor's career since taking office in 2011, following in his father's footsteps. And coming up in business news, another major company is requiring its employees to be vaccinated. Those stories and much more right after the break. Kathy Hochul, my lieutenant governor, is smart and competent. This transition must be seamless, but she can come up to speed quickly, and my resignation will be effective in 14 days. New York State will have its first female chief executive in just two weeks. Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul taking the reins after Governor Cuomo announced his resignation in the middle of a sexual harassment scandal. Thanks so much for staying with us. I'm Corey Chambers. And I'm Tamson Fidel. Well, for some watching this play out, it may feel like deja vu. It was just 13 years ago that we watched another New York State governor resign after a stunning fall from grace. Yeah, tonight, Mary Murphy has a look at what the past can tell us about where things go from here. To every New Yorker and to all those who believed in what I tried to stand for, I sincerely apologize. March 10, 2008, Governor Elliot Spitzer resigned with his wife beside him just two days after he was identified as client number nine in a prostitution scandal. Lieutenant Governor David Patterson took over. My heart goes out to Elliot Spitzer, his wife Silda. His three daughters. This time, Governor Cuomo seems to be getting a lot less sympathy, but Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul has had a lot more time to prepare, according to Democratic lobbyist Jerry Kremer. So she's not coming into this uh, totally blindsided like uh, David Patterson was when Elliot Spitzer resigned uh, on 48 hours notice. She's been uh, preparing probably since February when it was pretty clear that there might be a transition and that the governor might resign. February is when a litany of women started going public, complaining about Governor Cuomo's alleged inappropriate behavior. 
Hochul released a statement. I agree with Governor Cuomo's decision to resign. It is the right thing to do and in the best interest of New Yorkers. She's a lawyer whose background includes one term in Congress, and she was Cuomo's number two for six years, visiting all 62 New York counties. She led a task force on COVID-19 from her base in western New York. We have to stop this this tsunami from coming from New York City all the way across the state. Jerry Kremer says Hochul has several pressing issues she will have to deal with. The cannabis board, in order to get the legalization of marijuana moving forward, has not been appointed and the governor's recommendations never came to the Senate. In addition, you have vacancies at the top of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. It's widely believed Hochul will make a run for governor in 2022, appealing to working moms. I can speak about their issues. I know what it's like to be a mom uh, trying to balance career and home life. But Hochul could face some stiff competition from the current attorney general, Letitia James, who released a scathing nursing home report about Cuomo and the recent findings on sexual harassment. She benefits from the fact that she's already had great name recognition. So she's got a head start over any other candidate. I'm Mary Murphy, PIX11 News. Over the past 50 years, a member of the Cuomo family has played a prominent role in New York state politics. Andrew Cuomo followed his father, Mario Cuomo, to become governor in 2011. And well, tonight we're looking back at some of the highs and the lows of Governor Cuomo's three terms in office. Andrew Cuomo was sworn into office January 1st, 2011. In 10 and a half years in the governor's office, Cuomo had a share of wins and losses. His first victory, the Marriage Equality Act, in June of 2011. He fulfilled a campaign promise, making New York the seventh state to legalize same-sex marriages. A month after the 2012 shooting that took the lives of 26 people, including 20 children at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut, Cuomo signed what he called the toughest gun control law in the country. The New York SAFE Act expanded the definition of banned assault weapons, expanded background checks, and put limits on magazine rounds. Portions were struck down on appeal, but the majority remain. That same year, the legislature passed the Women's Equality Act, 10 bills affecting issues such as domestic violence, human trafficking, and reproductive health, making legalized abortion state law. In 2017, Cuomo included the Excelsior Scholarship in the 2018 budget. The program offers free tuition to state colleges for certain qualified students in exchange for a requirement they live and work in the state for four years after graduation. Inspired by his ex-girlfriend Sandra Lee's battle with breast cancer, the governor expanded free and low-cost mammogram coverage for all women in New York. But with the victories came the scandals. The commission he set up to root out corruption was disbanded after reports it steered clear of investigations that could be politically damaging. In 2018, friend and former aide Joe Percoco was convicted of federal bribe and fraud charges related to the Buffalo Billion Development Project. During the same investigation, Todd Howe, another former aide, was indicted along with other developers who were major donors to the governor. Cuomo was never accused of any wrongdoing. While universally praised for his handling of the pandemic, Cuomo has been criticized for the scandal around nursing home deaths that, along with questions about his $5 million book deal and mishandled construction on the Mario Cuomo Bridge, are all being looked at as part of the impeachment investigation. And our coverage of Cuomo's resignation continues online. You can also find our original reporting at PIX11.com. Well, after weeks of back and forth on Capitol Hill, the $1 trillion infrastructure bill has passed in the Senate. Yeah, but it's not over yet. We're going to tell you what's next. Yeah, and the mission to the moon delayed. Coming up, we'll tell you why the plans were put on hold and when it's expected to lift off. After months of negotiated, Senate lawmakers are finally poised to pass a bipartisan infrastructure bill today. And the bill will provide funds to several areas, from roads and bridges to modernized broadband across the U.S. Kelly Meyer has more from Washington. The bill, as amended, is passed. In a rare bipartisan vote, the first part of President Joe Biden's infrastructure agenda cleared the Senate. This is a big, big thing. Virginia Democrat Mark Warner was part of the group that helped get the $1.2 trillion deal across the finish line. It gained the support of all 50 Democratic senators, including Georgia's John Ossoff. I voted to pass this historic bipartisan investment in Georgia's infrastructure. 
in America's infrastructure. In the end, 19 Republicans voted with Democrats, one of them North Carolina's Tom Tillis. What we're talking about is demonstrating that we can come up with bipartisan agreements. But a majority of Republicans couldn't get on board with the bill. Florida Senator Rick Scott voted against the measure over the size and scope. It's frustrating for me because I support infrastructure. But less than half of this money is going to go to roads, bridges, airports, and seaports. Senator Marco Rubio said he didn't support the bill because it tied to the larger human infrastructure package. Which is a $3.5 trillion Bernie Sanders budget. President Joe Biden celebrated the passage and thanked the senators who voted in support of the bill. That I truly believe will transform America. This isn't the end of the road. The House will still need to pass the package, and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has already said that she won't do that without the $3.5 trillion spending bill in tow. We're learning that the House will return early from August recess to consider both infrastructure bills and possibly tackle voting rights. Reporting in Washington, I'm Kelly Meyer. All right, time for your Strictly Business Report. Starting off with a look at Wall Street. Here's how the markets wrapped up today. Stocks ending the day split, the Dow gaining 162 points. Well, Citigroup's latest company to require employees returning to its New York headquarters and several other cities to be vaccinated against COVID-19. Bank officials announced today that workers will be expected to be vaccinated when they begin returning for two days a week in September. For now, the move applies to employees in the New York, Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, and D.C. offices. Google employees could make less money if they decide to work from home permanently. That's according to Reuters. The company has unrolled a calculator to explain possible pay cuts based on how far workers are from their offices. The report says regional cost of living differences are factored into the calculation. For example, people remote working from parts of Connecticut would make less than those who remain in New York City or in San Francisco. And NASA's mission to return astronauts to the moon is being delayed due to problems developing new spacesuits right now. The agency had planned to land a crew on the lunar surface in 2024. Today, NASA officials announced that the next generation of spacesuits will not be ready until at least 2025. The report cited funding shortfalls, unforeseen technical challenges, and the impacts of COVID-19 for the missed deadline. And that's a look at tonight's Strictly Business Report. Corey. All right, Tamsin. When we come back, the battle over face coverings heats up in Florida. Why some educators could lose their salary if they, if they make students wear masks. And get ready to pay up for your child's school supplies. Just how much experts expect you to pay this year and why prices are going up. Andy. And coming up in sports, Mets taking on the Nats, Yankees and KC. Another rough day for Zach Wilson. We have to talk about this. And Barkley, back for day two. But is he going to be ready for the first game of the season? Well, we're going to check in with Coach because sports is coming up next. Well, students return to class in Florida this week. Some educators are defying Governor Ron DeSantis' order banning mask mandates. Yeah, now the governor is threatening to withhold the salaries of school board members and administrators who require students and staff to wear facial coverings. The state's two largest districts are requiring masks despite the threat as the Delta variant continues to spread out of control in many areas. Florida has become the epicenter of the pandemic in the U.S. with record-breaking levels of new cases and hospitalizations daily. With the start of the school year just about a month away, you might be thinking about your back to school budget. Some experts are saying, get ready to pay more and dig deeper because everything's gonna cost a little bit more than it used to. The National Retail Federation says the average household will spend about $850 this year for school supplies compared to 685 bucks in 2018. They say the price jump is because parents now have to spend more on electronic items and kids are heading back to school for in-person learning. We're probably going to buy more apparel, more sneakers, those kinds of things, because for the last year, year and a half, we haven't bought any. Hmm. National Retail Federation says college students and their families will likely spend even more, about $1,200 on average. All right, let's go ahead and talk about what is happening outside. Come tomorrow, because we have some changes in store. Hi, G. Tail in the Thames, that's what's going to be, a real heat wave shaping up. And uh, just putting out some tips that you all know about already, but let's emphasize, stay hydrated, obviously no alcohol, check in on the elderly, and also never leave kids and pets in 
car. And uh, for more tips on this upcoming heat wave and what to do, pix11.com slash beat the heat, and they'll tell you all about the nearest cooling centers to your home. All right, 73 degrees, 77 degrees north, there's I slip in at 74. The uh, dew point measuring humidity is already oppressive at night, approaching 11 o'clock. When you got a platform like that, you got a problem because the problem is going to be lasting not only through Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, perhaps Saturday as well. We had a couple of scattered showers go on by. They're out, they're gone, that's good. And now we got heat. 25 million people will be affected by a heat indices of 100 plus. That's an awful lot. The whole country is warm, if not hot. Border to border, coast to coast, three time zones. 104 degrees the heat index in the city. 100 degrees will be the heat index moving forward, and then eventually by Thursday and Friday, perhaps as high as 104. Top winds 40 miles per hour, cyclone six. All right, if it becomes a named storm, it will be Fred. And a lot of dry air, a lot of shearing with this storm. So what's gonna happen is, you got a tropical storm warning in effect for the Virgin Islands and also Puerto Rico. Uh, I think it'll be weak. I think it has to be watched. We'll do that. It's a heat wave, 90s, the next four days. The heat wave breaks Sunday and Monday. Each week, Pistol Oven has been spotlighting small businesses that need a helping hand as they navigate our new normal. This week, we pay a visit to a New Jersey bike shop that managed to turn it all around. Yeah, all it took was a slight pivot, and now they're busier than ever before. And Ramos has a story from Bloomfield. The expression, a classic never goes out of style, has never rung more true within the walls of Jalapeno Cycling in Bloomfield. It's where husband and wife Andrew Ryman and Catherine Cummings saw their bike business, which functioned more as a sales and pro training service, evolve overnight to maintenance-based. Heightened anxiety over public transportation made their service all the more essential. We did have a lot of essential workers who were trying to get off the bus and off of mass transit, who ended up coming in and using that service. Deliveries. Uh uh, grocery stores, um, and we had a huge influx uh, of people from surrounding communities. Communities like nearby Newark and Belleville, where essential workers account for nearly 50% of residents. With bicycles seeing a renaissance of sorts, suppliers across the country have struggled to keep up with demand. But it also means that those rusty and dusty bikes that were stowed away in storage or in a garage somewhere are getting a second lease on life after receiving the jalapeno treatment. I think I fixed up uh, an old 60s uh, Schwinn bike that hence been ridden since a kid was like, or the guy was like five years old. The couple also went virtual with their weekly spin cycle classes, another pivot that reaped benefits where they managed to expand their clientele now serving customers across the country. Aside from business, what really has these two bike enthusiasts smiling these days? How the craft they have long cherished now being embraced by the community. Just to see other people start to get that spark and, and see people clearly just out enjoying it. I, I just think it's I just think it's just a good energy to spread. Jalapeno Cycling is open Tuesday through Saturday. While walk-ins are welcomed, appointments are recommended. To get more information on this business and others now open, head over to our website, pix11.com. In Bloomfield, I'm Andrew Ramos, Pix11 News. All right, let's talk some sports now. Andy. All right, guys, you know, it was just a couple months ago, Yankees GM Brian Cashman said that his team stinks. Things change. Well, now it's the Mets GM that's saying that what we're seeing right now is, quote, unacceptably bad. That's unacceptably bad, and he is right. You know, the Mets they just got swept by the Phillies. They're now in third place, and tonight it was Mets taking on the Nats without Javi Baez, and this right here, not a good start. Juan Soto greets Carlos Carrasco with a three-run shot, and just like that, the Mets are down. But the Mets, they did come back. Dom Smith with a long RBI double. Watch that right there. It goes right over Soto's head. It's 3-1 Nationals. But then it started raining. And it started raining hard, and it kept going. So this game was suspended. They're going to pick things up tomorrow at 4:10. That game's going to start in the second inning, and they're going to play the full nine innings, followed by a seven-inning game at seven. So busy day for them tomorrow. As for the Yankees, they were taking on the Royals. Down 2-1 in the fourth. It's Higgy time. That's a two-run shot to left center. Yankees up 3-2. Sixth inning, just a good night for Salvador Perez. That's his second home run of the night. Game's tied at four. Fast forward now to the seventh inning. 
Royals now up 5-4. Steven Ridings, just a bad throw to first base. The Yankees made three errors in this one. Right now, Royals lead it 7-4 in the eighth. You know, it's never a good time for injuries. But injuries before the season even starts, it just seems so avoidable. Today, over at Giants camp, Nate Soldier had to leave practice because he hurt his shoulder. Now, Nate, he went to go see trainers. He says he's not sure exactly what happened, but the Giants, they need him and they need him healthy. You know, he's here to solidify the O-line. And essentially, essentially, they've got two jobs. One, protect Daniel Jones, and two, block for that man right there, Saquon Barkley. You know, Saquon was back at practice today. He looked good. Coach Joe Judge, he says he's happy with what he's seeing from his star running back. That being said, they're not going to rush him back too soon. we got to make sure that we control not only just what he does on the field, but then also the repetitions and the volume he gets within each period. So that's something we're going to keep an eye on in terms of how his body responds. We'll look to increase it as we go through this process. But in terms of yesterday, I was very encouraged how he came out and had a good day of work. Um, Look, good excitement for a lot of people having your players back out. Good, more of that. And less of this. We're going to talk about the Jets. It was another rough day for Zach Wilson. We'll break it down right after the break. We've been talking about it. It was a rough weekend for Zach Wilson. But Coach actually says everyone just needs to be patient. In fact, Coach says that things might get worse before they get better. But Jet fans, there's no room to get worse. Progress is imperative, but today things actually got worse. Wilson went 10 for 17. He was sacked six times. He threw one interception. It's not okay. Kid's going to be fine. So he's, uh, he's going through a process, and, and what I love about it is he's deliberate in his process and how he wants to, he's trying to find ways to get better. But like I said, there, there's things that he's trying. He really doesn't care about the noise. He doesn't care about any of it. He's just He's focused on trying to get himself ready to be the best quarterback in the league. Okay, as long as he performs when it's game time. That's what matters. Let's go back to City Field for a moment. Now, before the game, before it started raining, it was a different kind of game. Take a look right here. Today, today the Mets welcomed the military to City Field. It was a softball tournament. It was held between the five branches of the armed forces. Now, last year, it had to be postponed because of COVID. It's kind of a great event right there. By the way, Army won the tournament. It really is a great event. All right, guys, I'll send it back to you. All right, Andy, thank you. All right, G-Man, one last check for you. All again. right, uh, here we go, everybody. Cruz, you got the controls there for tomorrow early in the morning. You can see 76 degrees, very warm, very humid. This is your seven-day outlook, and everybody hang on, because this is a heat wave of uh, real uh, importance. We've hit 90 degrees 12 times this season, and if it's right, four or five days more of that, and that'll give us 17, 18 days, 90 degree plus temperatures. Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday will cool it down. If you're looking for a break in the heat wave, that will occur Saturday afternoon, Saturday night with a scattered shower or a thunderstorm about. The back half of the weekend, Sunday, will be the best part of the weekend. Once again, a major heat wave is approaching. Yeah, we will make sure and everyone uh, stay tuned and is aware of what to do and where the cooling centers are, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. Thanks so much for joining us for Pick 7 News at 10. I'm Corey Chambers. And I'm Tamsin Fidel. Seinfeld's coming up next for you. Good night.